There are a lot of different companies that have real value. And, you know, people have to go somewhere. I think you just can't be in cash because all these governments are just printing too much money. Three major U.S. banks on the verge of bankruptcy and begging the Fed to bail them out. Peter Schiff. A significant shift in direction was taken by the Bank of England a little over a month ago. To save its pension funds and bond market, it decided to abandon its fight against inflation. What occurred is the question, and what does this tell us about the struggle against inflation being waged by the Federal Reserve? On his podcast, Peter Schiff went into great detail and explained everything. An old saying goes, no one rings a bell, which means there are no signs of a significant top or bottom in the markets before it happens. However, Peter asserted that there is frequently a bell, but no one hears it. Peter commented the week before that we received the mother of all bells. Big Ben told, given that England is home to the bell in question. In this international game of chicken, the Bank of England was the first major central bank to show signs of weakness. Peter referred to this pop breakthrough as extremely significant because before the announcement, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey held views that were equally as hawkish as those held by Jerome Powell. It is simple to look back on the period following the epidemic and conclude that the Federal Reserve maintained a monetary policy that was too lax for too long despite increasing CPI because they believed it to be temporary. The central bank overlooked the inflation problem for several months. However, as Peter Schiff mentioned in a podcast, the issue of money that is too loose is something that is not brand new. This has been going on for a good many years. The Federal Reserve's adoption of an inflationary monetary policy may be traced back to 1998 and the bailout of long-term capital management. The primary responsibility of the Federal Reserve is to maintain price stability while also working to stave off economic downturns. This is accomplished through the use of the monetary policy. The Federal Reserve must implement a contractionary monetary policy to restrict economic growth and bring inflation under control. If inflation is higher than the Fed's target rate of roughly 2%, demand will increase, resulting in higher prices for goods. But the question is, why didn't Chairman of the Federal Reserve Jerome Powell act earlier? Peter claimed that he didn't want to create a problem by fighting inflation because, at the time, he could claim that inflation wasn't a problem. He explained this reasoning by saying he didn't want to create a problem by fighting inflation. The issue of inflation affects every country in the world, and the reason for that is that every one of these central banks made the same error. The Federal Reserve was the primary example for other central banks worldwide to follow. The inflation problem is worldwide, and it's because all these central banks made the same mistake. And unfortunately, they were pretty much following the Fed's lead. We are the issuer of the reserve currency, and so everybody else kind of marches to the beat of our drum. And we had interest rates at 1% or zero, and so everybody else had to come down. In fact, some countries went negative because they wanted their rates to be lower than ours. Well, when our rates are zero, how do you get below zero? So they actually went into uncharted territory in the twilight zone of, of negative rates, as irrational as that is. But that was only because we were at zero. They had to go negative. They wanted to have easy money in relation to a US. Well, the US, we went to zero. Uh, so we kind of corrupted uh, the monetary policy of the entire world. Uh, but I think the world is going to reject the dollar. It's already happening. I mean, in fact, with the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia and the example that we've sent to the world, I already think, you know, the Chinese and a lot of other uh, players are just not liking that and, and really wanting to uh, take away some of America's power. And the source of that power is the reserve status of the dollar. And we lose that and it's a whole new ball game here uh, because America's ability to live beyond its means is a function of the dollar's reserve status because we can print dollars and use those dollars that we print uh, to buy goods and services, mainly goods that we didn't produce. You know, it's kind of like these guys that issue uh, cryptocurrencies out of thin air, right? You know, what would that FTX token cost Bankman free nothing to create and he could just issuing them and have this huge value. Well, we do the same thing with the dollar. Cost us nothing. We create them out of thin air and then everybody signs a value. There's no question that gold is going to reemerge as the monetary unit of choice for the world. I mean, it's not an accident that gold was money for 5,000 years. It's been money for so long because it works. But governments, you know, didn't like the gold standard because if they wanted to spend money, they needed the gold. And so they needed to collect it through taxes because they didn't have gold. The private sector had gold. And so if the government wanted gold, 
to pay for some spending program. They had to take it from the people. As much as the people like government programs, they also hate paying taxes. Governments wanted a way to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to give people government programs, but not give them the bill. Now, you know, one way is like, well, we're gonna tax the rich, right? Don't worry about it. We're gonna give you all these goodies, but the rich people are gonna pay for it, right? Eventually, you know, you've taxed the rich to the point that you can't tax them any higher. Or, and now you have just the middle class left and there, you know, they don't wanna pay more taxes. So they just print money. We run these huge deficits and we pay for government with inflation. And that's why we have so much inflation because we have so much government that we didn't pay for through taxation. So we're paying for it through inflation, which means higher prices. So I think that the free market is going to reject uh, the dollar and other currencies because they're a flawed form of money because they are no longer a store of value. They can still function as a medium of exchange. You can still use them as a unit of account, but if they're not good, a good store of value, then then, you know, they're not good as a you know, medium of deferred payment. They're not good for lending and borrowing because you really have no idea if I loan you my dollars for 10 years. I mean, in a high inflation environment, I have no idea what those dollars might buy me in 10 years. They may buy me nothing. When the public starts to lose confidence in the value of the dollar, what are they going to use as an alternative? Well, they, they could use gold. Now, the inconvenience of using gold is, well, I've, I've got a bar of gold or I got a gold coin. I mean, one gold coin, how am I gonna, how am I gonna buy things with it? I mean, how am I gonna just, you know, exchange it? Now, of course, at one point we did do that. People had gold coins in their pockets and they had bills in their pockets that were backed by gold. And if they wanted to buy something small, well, they paid in silver or they paid in nickel or they paid in copper, right? That's the penny. But today, because of the technology that we have now, that we didn't have in the past when we were using gold as money, because we have the internet, because we have blockchain, we can tokenize the ownership of gold and issue digital currency backed by gold instead of paper currency backed by gold that can circulate as a medium of exchange very efficiently so that people can make big ticket purchases with gold. I could buy a car and pay in gold or I could buy a pack of chewing gum and pay in gold because you can break gold down into a fraction of a gram and then I can send that fraction of a gram around the world for a fraction of a cent. So it's like yeah. the current technology, and that's the irony, because all these Bitcoin guys were like, oh, see, blockchain is the death of gold. No, it's gonna lead to the rebirth of gold because Bitcoin is what we don't need. Gold is what gives the digital currency its value because uh, gold actually is the store of value, but with blockchain, it's a better medium of exchange than it had been in the past because it has all the attributes of Bitcoin, except better because it's faster and cheaper to transact, but it's also a store of value, which Bitcoin can never be because Bitcoin has no underlying value that can be stored. It worked for hundreds of years with paper. You know, you have trusted third parties that compete in a free market, and there will be certain tokens that will have a higher degree of trust and therefore will be more marketable than other tokens. And of course, companies can say our gold is audited Here's our independent auditors. We have insurance. We've paid, let's say, Lloyd's of London to insure our gold. So even if it gets stolen, Lloyd's has, you know, we've bought a, an insurance policy. And then of course, if Lloyd's is insuring the gold, then you have another set of eyes that's gonna make sure that it's secure. Otherwise they won't write the insurance policy. You know, you can store it with a company like Brinks, right? Brinks has been storing precious metals for over 150 years. They've never lost an ounce. That seems like a pretty good track record. So look, trusting third parties is what everybody does in, a ca in capitalism. If you have life insurance, you've trusted a third party to pay the claim, you know, when you die.